Um, I'm going to uh, talk about an even broader perspective than 100 years, maybe 150 years. And the topic is through housing. And the, the million program era is the time when Sweden built the most housing units per capita in the world. Uh, and, and we will talk also about how this is reconstructed or reconfigured to fit today's needs. And I will end up with uh, some of today's challenges in housing from the Swedish perspective. Um, and my name, as uh, Daniel said, is Eric Stenberg. And I um, would like to present this image from uh, 100 years ago uh, of how Sweden looked. This was the situation in housing for, for most of Sweden. We were a primarily agrarian society living in the countryside. And in a very short period of time, uh, coinciding with the development in, in Western Europe, we changed into this. We changed into a society completely um, filled with the ideals of the welfare state. Um, and this was a very uh, difficult but also successful uh, trip for Sweden. Um, and we did this also through the urban planning. So it was not just um, the citizens moving uh, to the cities and becoming more affluent and becoming um, um, more um, uh, more able to contribute to the welfare state, but we also formed and were formed by the uh, construction of the um, new satellite cities. This is maybe the most famous one from 1956, Vällingby, uh, where the ideals of the ABC city were expounded. Uh, A stood for Arbeta, which is work, and B for Bostäder, which is housing, and C for center or commercial facilities. And if you look closely at the people in the image, you can see that um, they are suddenly very well dressed and, and almost look rested compared to the first image of the farmers who are um, are toiling heavily from day to day to, to just for subsistence. Um, and so in a hundred year perspective, the, the urban challenge, uh, urbanization challenge in Sweden, how it's been handled by housing, is that we've gone from only 25% of, of citizens living in urban areas to 85% in 100 years. Um, and we have a few uh, seminal points, and, and one is 1930 when we introduced um, the international style or modernism. We introduced to Sweden through an exhibit, the Stockholm exhibit, and we call it funkis or functionalism. And this is where modernism uh, is introduced as, a, as an architecture style. In 1945, right at the end of World War II, we also have the political movement of the people's home, Folkhemmet, where we are, are trying to um, raise the welfare uh, of the citizen in order to free time for work, play, and to production, and therefore increase the tax base and, and be able to make better schools, better housing, um, and uh, better health care. Um, from the 1960s to the middle of the 70s, we have uh, what we call the record years. And the record years is when we build um, almost one-third of Sweden's total housing stock in a 15-year period. And the million program era is the 10-year period from 1965 to 1974, when we build one million units of housing um, in 10 years. That's 100,000 units per year. And by the end of the million program era, we had removed the sanitary uh, problems. We had raised the standard of housing from being very low, some of the lowest uh, uh, standards in, in Europe and maybe um, uh, the, the, the westernized world, uh, to some of the highest standards. Um, and interesting to know is that um, housing units from before 1930 are only 10% of the Swedish housing stock. So 90% of all housing built in Sweden today, the about four, four and a half million units, have been built since 1930. So we're a completely modernized country. Um, and this, um, this growth uh, is best exemplified by this graph, where the, the blue is total number of multifamily housing units built, um, and there's 20, 30, 40, 60, 80,000 units, and the red is single family units. And so the total number here is per year, and you can see the years below. And so the million program era is this period from 1965 to 1974, 
when the production peaks. And it's, it's good to remember that not all of this housing was the large multifamily units. One third were actually single family units. One third were multifamily units up to four stories and one third were above four stories. And those are the ones usually associated with the post-war housing areas. If you think large scale concrete housing areas. Um, but in order to get there, to, to make that production, Sweden had to rely on a long period of knowledge buildup. So this has also been part of our research and, and part of what we've looked at. Um, how did we align the building industry, regulation, financing, education of architects and engineers, um, in, um, innovation and, uh, and other um, industrial components had to be developed as we had to produce more and more housing at a better quality. And this is the key. Um, we were able to couple quality and quantity at that time in order to produce more. But then something happened here. There was a rapid decline. And that is uh, mostly tied to um, what I would call the, the, the modern postmodern shift. So if you think the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, where industrialization slowed down, we had a slowdown of the economy in Sweden, uh, the urbanization also slowed down, and we didn't need as much housing. What happened was companies went bankrupt, um, people retired, factories were actually sold to other countries and the knowledge that we had built up disappeared and then we haven't been doing uh, very much in terms of housing since then. Um, but the ambitions in the 60s were very high. Um, from the government proposition from 1967 which says the whole population shall be given healthy, spacious, well planned and, and this is where I, I usually challenge um, today's politicians to promise half of this. They can say, okay, we can give healthy, spacious, well-planned, and maybe purposefully equipped dwellings, and then high quality at a fair price. That's when they get very nervous. Um, so this was a high ambition, a political ambition, driven top-down, which was also realized. Um, and it was realized mainly through industrialized building. And industrialized building was not only prefabrication, it was also standardization, repetitive building, modularization, um, flexible building, and any number of, of subcategories of industrialized building. Um, many people think that the cranes were uh, determining where the buildings should stand or how tall the buildings should be, but actually the crane was developed as the production methods needed to get more rational and, and faster. So we started with small cranes and then we built bigger and bigger cranes to build bigger houses faster. Um, and in the mid 60s I've actually found that we had um, 16 different prefabricated concrete structural systems for housing. Um, is there anyone in the audience, the, the national audience, not the international audience, that knows how many we have today? No, maybe three, four, maybe six or seven if we count wood systems also. Um, and my conclusion is that instead of the reputation of the post-war era building being monotonous and drab and concrete and very uniform, then maybe it also was a very innovative period. There were very strict rules, but within those rules, the innovation was fairly high. So these structural systems actually showed different qualities. Some had very many small elements that could be um, shipped a long distance. Some had big elements that could be erected quickly. And so there was a number of innovations going on. Um, but all in all, the housing uh, from the post-war era can be said to be um, well-planned and of high standard. High standard is just what I explained. We were able to put bathrooms, functioning bathrooms and kitchens into all homes. Uh, essentially by the end of the 70s. The well-planned means that we used a functionalist uh, ethic and, and if you sum that up, uh, I need a table for an eating area that can fit two plates that has enough food for me to eat to, to work a day's job and I need to be able to fit the casserole from the oven in between the plates. I can then determine the width of the table. Then I need to know how much space I need behind the chair in order to um, be able to push in and push out and people to pass behind me. And once I've determined how much space I need to eat, I can set up the functional space of the eating area and put up the walls around that. That um, 
is a very literal construction of form follows function. So form follows function has driven the Swedish housing. And it was driven by very, um, very scientific studies. So these were studies done in different in research institutes, for example, the Home Research Institute, where, um, uh, where we would cook a specific meal then. This is fish au gratin with tomatoes and potatoes and rose hip soup, and see how the movements were in order to determine the movement. And, and this, uh, with today's eyes, can seem a little bit uh, strange and offbeat, but the, the true movement was in women's liberal, liberal liberalization movement was to um, free the time spent in the home doing unpaid work for the woman. In the early um, uh, 20th century, it took up to 14 hours to run a home. And by the end of the 70s, it took four hours to run a home because of a uh, functioning kitchen, functioning stove. There was a, a refrigerator in most homes that could actually hold the food for one week. You didn't have to um, go and prepare food. Uh, all the time and cook and clean. And those 10 hours that were saved could be invested into education and a paid job instead. So this was very much a concerted and, and concentrated effort of the welfare state. Um, so I met, this, um, I met this housing from this period um, 20 years ago when I um, redesigned an apartment. Uh, and I, I found out that these units can be pulled out like drawers um, and rearranged, that many of them were flexible. And this was actually considered from the beginning. Uh, these were ideas that had been um, developed at the same time, part of this innovation. And so I was able to, um, through a series of, of apartment restructurings, I was able to uh, also create what I call Tensta's first flat. And Tensta is a suburb of Stockholm, which is um, nationally known as one of the, the uh, lowest socioeconomic standards. Um, it's a multicultural suburb, like we find in many uh, cities. Um, it is uh, looked down upon from, from, the, um, from, from many perspectives as being um, low income, uh, low work, low school results, etc. But instead, I would like to, to change the perspective and say that's where some of the best housing is and also some of the, the f uh, future potential. And I will show how. Um, this was where we put, we added two apartments together and made a 166 square meter flat. Um, that flat has five bedrooms, one, two, three, four, five bedrooms, two large living rooms, a large kitchen, three bathrooms, two entries, and um, it's rented out for the sum of, of 1,300 euro per month, which is half the cost of new production. So put into the perspective of, of today's construction, this is a very um, solid investment that was done 50 years ago that can be adapted to today's society. And living in the apartment today is a Somali-Swedish family with, with mother and father and 10 kids. And they used to live in a two-bedroom apartment. And when they lived in the two-bedroom apartments, they were exhibiting all the signs of overcrowding and, and difficulties that we had 100 years ago at the advent of the urbanization in, in Sweden. And so this is a very easy way to, to um, help that. And if we broaden the picture a little bit and look at what is being built in new production today, um, I did a study of, of the 4,700 units that are being um, uh, that were given a building permit in Stockholm in 2014. Um, and we build much smaller apartments. We build studios and single uh, bedroom apartments. During the Million Program era, we had uh, rationalized the methods um, such that we could build two bedroom apartments for almost everyone. Um, we're building much smaller apartments now. Um, of course, we do need small apartments, but maybe not the numbers that we're putting up. Uh, those small apartments are also um, bigger because we are uh, using thicker buildings to meet energy demands. So we have a, a conflict of interest. We, we make thicker houses, thicker walls, um, and that means it's longer corridors. Um, and longer corridors is a waste of space, uh, built space. And so um, if we're building lots of single and, and two bedroom apartments, but they are bigger than the, than the ones we built in the 50s and 60s, we might as well be building one and two bedroom apartments if we plan better. Um, and the effect 
um, that we have had of current building practices in housing and the inability to rejuvenate and reno renovate the um, apartments from the 60s and 70s is that segregation is growing. And segregation in Stockholm, Malmö and Gothenburg can be summed up by the statistic that if you grow up or are born into a socioeconomic weak area, you have an average lifespan that's eight years shorter than if you grow up in a rich area in Sweden. And this obviously conflicts with the idea of the welfare state and equality for all. Um, and so we're faced with this incredible um, challenge today. This is the historical perspective that I showed you earlier. This is from 1915 or 1970s in, in today's celebration um, to the current situation in, in 2016 or 2017 and a 50 year uh, perspective forward. The full housing production and then the prognosis. These are the demands that the National Board of Housing now uh, says that we have. We have demands to reach levels um, looking like the million program era. However, we don't have the knowledge build up. We have, we have not been producing enough housing to build up industry. We don't have enough architects. We don't have enough engineers. We don't have the rules, the regulation, etc., in order to produce 100,000 units of quality housing per year. And therefore, there's a lot of discussion today about removing hindrances, removing um, planning processes, which means lowering quality. So the risk is that the new production demand will um, produce a lot of uh, low quality housing at a high price, which we need to renovate in 15 to 20 years. And now coupling to the million program era, this peak needs to be renovated at the same time. And that's the dotted line that runs above. So what's happening in the construction industry is that we're focusing on the new production instead of renovating that which was built well and with a lot of knowledge. So the risk is also that we will renovate the existing stock um, poorly. And therefore we are not taking care of the built environment and producing a sustainable built environment. We're simply uh, following the market economy, which is short-sighted instead of the long-sighted um, um, holistic thinking. So um, one of the uh, projects uh, that I work with uh, and collaborate with others at KTH is called Green Housing Stockholm. And this is where we deal with a lot of these issues. Um, this is a, a diagram of the ambition and the ambition is sustainable urban growth. Um, we, we want to drive this innovation. We want to find the small companies um, that will grow at the same rate that they grew in the, in the 60s. And we also want to uh, find ways of, of breaking segregation through housing, using housing, renovation and housing production to find a more sustainable um, development. Um, and finally, I would like to laud and applaud the work of students. Um, we have through a number of courses through the, the last eight years or 10 years, put together um, a, a big knowledge base about Swedish um, million program era housing from the structural, from the social, from the eco ecological perspectives. And we have also now started to link this to an international knowledge base. So this is an exhibit that's happening right now at the Tensta Konsthall, which is the um, art gallery in Tensta, the suburb that I mentioned earlier, which places Tensta um, as, a, as a suburb that's always seen as um, a small situation on the periphery of something greater, the capital of Sweden. It instead places Tensta at the center of a global discussion about post-war housing. And seen in that perspective, the housing built in Tensta is some of the best that's ever been built. Um, it is truly extraordinary how well adapted it is to change how uh, 150 different nationalities can coexist in one area that was actually built for a Swedish nuclear family. Um, and that looking and comparing to, for example, the work of Pedro Alonso and Hugo Palmarola from Chile, the Swedish examples on the right hand side, um, with the then Prime Minister Olof Palme looking across at uh, Salvador Allende's work um, can be proud of what was done during the Million Program era, can say that Swedish housing 
was and is truly some of the best in the world. Thank you.